And so let's look at this passage. Today we are uh, calling this something worth boasting about. And let me start with an illustration. This uh, famous Texan preacher, George Truett, he was asked to be a guest in the home of a very wealthy oil man in, in Texas. And after the meeting, or sorry, after the meal, the host led him to a place where they could get a good view of the surrounding area. And then pointing to the oil wells, he boasted, 25 years ago I had nothing. Now, as far as you can see, it is all mine. And then looking at the other direction, at his sprawling fields of grain, he said, that's all mine too. And then turning east, I guess that's east over there, turning east toward huge herds of cattle, he bragged, and they're all mine as well. And then pointing to the west at a scenic forest, he exclaimed, that too is mine. And so he paused. He was waiting for Dr. Truett to compliment him on his great success. And so Truett put one hand on the man's shoulder, and then with the other hand he pointed upward, and he said, how much do you have in that direction? Well, that's a good question. How much do we have in the heavenly direction? Well, we all boast in something. And the question that I want us to consider this morning is what are we boasting in? What are we boasting in? And what we're going to discover from this passage in Galatians 6 is that we are to boast in the cross. Because of the significance of the man who died on it. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to unpack that statement. We are to boast in the cross because of the significance of the man who died on it. And so let's work our way through these verses, 11 on to 18. It says, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. And it was common in Paul's day for forged letters to circulate to the many churches in the region. False teachers would write letters in Paul's name or in Peter's name or in the name of some other apostle to mislead Christians. For example, if we go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, and I believe these verses appear on the screen, or they will appear on the screen. It says this, it says, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. And so there were people writing letters with false theology, and they would sign that it was in the name of Paul. Now, Paul would dictate his letters. He didn't write them on his own. He would dictate his letters to a stenographer. And when he reached the end, however, he would take the quill from the stenographer and write the final words with his own hands. And this is what he's saying here. And this would assure that the letter was indeed from Paul. It would prove that it was genuine. Back at Second Thessalonians, that, just that same chapter that I read, verse 17 of chapter 3, he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. And so he would sign his name or write a last paragraph, sign his name on the letter to prove that it was from him and not from some forger. Then he mentions, though, that he writes with large letters. Now, this may be due to Paul's poor eyesight. Remember when he was going on to Damascus to persecute Christians, he had this massive vision of the Lord and he was blinded for three days as a result of that. And then he was healed. 
But it appears that it may be that he had visual issues as a result of that. Even though he was healed, he did have some consequences. For example, if we go to chapter 4 of Galatians, verse 15, he may be alluding to this fact. He says, where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So it appears that he had some issues with his vision. And so that may be why he's writing with large letters or Maybe he's writing with large letters as a way of stressing what he's about to say. Sometimes I'll get emails or texts and they're all in caps, right? Because they want to stress this, this is important. And so perhaps that's why he was writing in large letters, to stress the importance of what he had to say. So those are two possible reasons. Now it turns out the Roman Empire was ruling at this time and the Jewish people had legal sanction to freely worship. They had synagogues all over the place. They could worship freely. But the new Christian movement was outlawed. And so the temptation, I believe, and this is maybe one of the reasons why he says, you know, they're trying to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So the temptation, I believe, was, was the Galatian believers wanted to join this Jewish religion by getting circumcised and thus come under the shelter of the state. For example, in many totalitarian regimes today, there are two churches. There's a state church, which complies and compromises its message to survive. And any person joining the state church is free, to, is free from persecution so long as they submit to government uh, controls. But also in a totalitarian regime, there'll be a underground church, which does not compromise, and yet it is persecuted. And so there is a temptation among the believers in the underground church to, uh, you know, to join the state church to avoid persecution. So this could have been what was going on to some extent is by getting circumcised, not only were these Galatian believers, would they assume Jewish identity, but they would also escape persecution. That was the temptation of why they were willing to submit to circumcision, although it didn't happen because Paul intervened. So the question I'm asking here is, are we making compromises in our walk with the Lord to avoid persecution? The religious freedoms we have may soon come to an end. We don't know. North America has enjoyed religious liberty for centuries. Yet scripture warns us that such freedoms do not last forever. In fact, I read an article just a few days ago. The Grace Community Church, which is the church John MacArthur pastors, they have been given an order to cease and, des cease and desist. Is that what it's called? Desist and cease? Anyway, whatever. The mayor of Los Angeles has ordered the Department of Public Works to shut off water and electricity to houses of worship should they hold services. Right here in L.A., California, North America. Meanwhile, he turns a blind eye to the riots and the looting and the property damage going on in the city. A little bit of a double standard there. So it just shows that, you know, our freedoms can be step by step slowly taking, taken away. Verse 13, it tells us this. It says, for those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. And so the false teachers, you know, they weren't really concerned about law keeping. They were not concerned about being Torah observant. What they were occupied with was making converts so that they could report back to head office to the rulers in Jerusalem. Say, look how many converts we got. Aren't we good? Maybe, you know, they get a promotion of some, some sort. You know, this would be like sending off a, to head office statistics on how many conversions we've had here or how many baptisms we performed so that, you know, they'll compile it and they do that. You know, I'm, I'm not saying this is a wrong thing, but the NAB sends out periodically a, a form that we fill out, how many baptisms have you had, how many conversions have you had, etc. So, you know, they can put it together and then send it out to all the churches. But here's a question. Are we converting people to Christianity to make us look good? 
Are we pressuring people to get baptized so we can boast in numbers? Sometimes the pastor's conferences, you know, we pastors fall into the trap of comparing numbers. You know, we'll, we'll talk to one another and, you know, how many people are in your congregation? Have you been growing? And, you know, whatever. And if we have been growing, then we feel good about ourselves. But if our numbers are down, we are not so keen to share the numbers. So rather than boasting in our success, we ought to boast in the cross. Verse 14, it says, But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul had a lot he could boast about, but he did not boast that he was an apostle. He did not boast in his ministry success. He did not boast in his Jewish heritage. What did he boast in? Well, he tells us right here, he boasts in the cross. Paul was radically cross-centered. He made much of the cross. For over 16 year, 1,600 years, 1,600 centuries, not 1,600 centuries, 16 centuries, sorry about that, the cross has been a sacred and sentimental symbol of our faith. We have crosses as necklaces, we have crosses in sanctuaries, we've got one right here. We have crosses on our bumpers, bumper stickers, we even have crosses on the cover of our Bibles, with crosses everywhere. But let me ask you a question. What comes to mind when I say news? What comes to mind when I say electric chair? Or what comes to mind when I say lethal injection? I'm sure such thoughts are not pleasant. In fact, you may be offended by these words. But in Paul's day, the cross was an instrument of the most cruel and agonizing means of execution ever devised in human history. There was no more cruel way to execute somebody. The worst criminals were nailed to crosses. Imagine having an electric chair hanging around your neck or a noose behind me rather than a cross. Or imagine rather than a cross on the top of your building would be a big syringe. You know, people would think, you guys are nuts. This is highly offensive. But this gives us a glimpse of the horror and loathing at the mention of the cross in Paul's day. How could the Lord Jesus be the hope of the nations if he's executed as the worst criminal in the most cruel and agonizing way? Does the cross not suggest that Jesus is an accursed one rather than a blessed one? In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul talks about the offense of the cross. In verse 23 of 1 Corinthians, it says, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block. I mean, how in the world can this guy be the Messiah when he's executed on a cross? That was a stumbling block to the Jewish people. And then it says to the Gentiles, foolishness. You guys are nuts worshiping this person who was executed. But Paul could boast, and we too can boast in this instrument of torture because of the significance of the man who died on it. Paul could glory in the cross because of what Jesus achieved on the cross. On the cross, Jesus solved our sin problem. On the cross, Jesus accomplished salvation for the whole world. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. It says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. This is why Jesus died on a cross. To take away our sin. And so when we know the significance of Jesus' death on the cross, we can then agree that the cross is not something that should offend. It is something we can boast in. If we have experienced salvation 
we should boast in the cross. If we are redeemed, we should boast in the cross. If we have experienced the forgiveness of sin, we should boast in the cross. Now, a few weeks ago, we learned that through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus, sin is rendered powerless. He says in chapter 5, verse 24, for those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and lusts. So our relationship with sin is over now that we are in Christ Jesus. And here Paul tells us not only that we have been crucified with Christ, but that in Christ our relationship with the world is over. He says this, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. One way to describe the world is the spirit of the age. I think that's a pretty good definition. When the scripture talks about the world, you can view the world in two ways. One is people, for God so loved the world. That's a positive sense of the word, world. But there's also the negative sense of the word, world, and that refers to the spirit of the age. And although the world crowned the Lord with thorns, it will crown us with success if we deny the Lord. The world promises to make a name for ourselves if we dismiss the name of Jesus. The world offers us pleasures and rewards if we reject God. So there's always an antagonism, an antagonism between the spirit of the age, and the spirit of God. To Paul, the spirit of the age is like a felon executed upon a cross. This is as I died to the world and the world died to me. Between Paul and the world, there was a cross. And as Christians, as believers in Christ Jesus, we have parted ways with the world system, with the spirit of the age. Not through a divorce, but through a death. We have been crucified with Christ. We have been crucified to the world. We have parted ways with this world because we are united to Christ Jesus. And when we love the Lord, we lose all love for the spirit of the age. And so let us not hold the spirit of the age in high esteem. Because the spirit of the age seeks to liquidate the name of Christ Jesus from this world. The spirit of the age may be attractive, it may be alluring, but it is abhorrent to God. A.W. Tozer, a great uh, theologian of the past, he once wrote, we must do something about the cross, and one of two things only can we do, flee from it, or die upon it. Those are the two options. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, he wasn't saying carry a particular burden. I believe what he was saying was die. Die to self. Die to sin. Die to the spirit of the age. And so, like Paul, we are to die to the spirit of the age so that we may live by the spirit of the Lord. And so we can boast in the cross because of the significance of the man who died on it. And then in verse 15 it says, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Now circumcision has no power to deal with our sin problem. Zero. Circumcision has no ability to unite us to Christ Jesus. All outward expressions of our Christian faith are to be understood as culturally relevant but not spiritually necessary. All outward expressions of our Christian faith are to be understood as culturally relevant. They may have significance to us. They may have powerful symbolic value but are not spiritually necessary. What is of value, Paul is saying here, is to be regenerated by God. That's what's of value. 
a new creation. And when we come to Christ Jesus in repentance and faith, we are no longer the person we used to be. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. I love this verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation or a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. That's what is important to be new creatures in Christ Jesus. Since we are new creations in Christ Jesus, we are to live in a new way. And this is what he says in verse 16. And those who walk by this rule, what rule is he referring to? The rule of the fact that we are new creations in Christ. Those who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Living as new creations in Christ Jesus should be the guiding principle of our lives. Whether we are Gentile believers or Jewish believers. And so I want to talk about this term, Israel of God, for a moment. Because this term has been the cause of debate for centuries. What is Paul referring to? when he mentions the Israel of God. Is Paul speaking about ethnic Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people? Or does he mean the Israel of God is the church? Is the church the new Israel? Is the Israel of God referring to the church? Well, to answer this question, we need to briefly delve into church history. So I'm going to give you a two-minute lesson on church history specific to this. Let's begin with this. There is no historical evidence that the term Israel was identified as the church until 160 AD. So for more than a century after Paul, there was no evidence that the church was the Israel of God. After the book of Acts, however, once the apostles, the age of the, the apostolic age was over, there was a gradual parting of ways that took place between Christianity and Judaism. Until that time, Christianity was actually a subset of Judaism. But as the church became more and more Gentile, as the gospel left Israel and went into the Gentile lands, as the church became more and more Gentile and less and less Jewish, there was a split. In some ways, it was an antagonistic and hostile split. You could almost call it a divorce. And part of the divorce settlement was that the church took for itself all the blessings of Israel and conveniently left all the curses to Israel. So they took the blessings and they left the curses. And from that point onward, the church was referred to as the new Israel. So this is where we get the term, the church is the new Israel. It's from that parting of the ways. The thinking was this, that God was done with the Jewish people because on the whole they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So now God is going to fulfill his purposes, his evangelistic purposes. The witness of God is now done through the church and not through the nation of Israel. And so from 150 AD, the term Israel of God was to be understood as a reference to the church. And this is where the seeds were sown for the doctrine of replacement theology. Replacement theology meaning the church has replaced Israel. So that's how it kind of began. And... And that's how replacement theologians would interpret the Israel of God. It is the church. And yet, that's a historical, now let's do a little biblical survey, all 65 plus occurrences of the term Israel in the New Testament refer to ethnic Israel. There is no term, and the only one that's potentially debatable is this one. All other terms for Israel are referring to Israel as a nation. And just as there are two kinds of Gentiles, Paul talks about two kinds of Gentiles, the unbelieving world of Gentiles and the believing Gentiles. Well, in the same way, there are two kinds of Israel. There's unbelieving Israel and believing Israel. There's Israel of God, referred to here, and Paul talks about Israel after the flesh in Corinthians. And so the Israel of God, I believe, is also known as the remnant of Israel. In other words, there's a remnant of believers 
from the nation of Israel who believe in Christ Jesus, and that is what I believe Paul is referring to, the Israel of God referring to the believers from the stock of Israel. In Christ Jesus, we know that there is no, there is neither male nor female, there is neither Greek nor Jew. But when I came to faith in Christ Jesus, I did not cease to be a man. And you did not cease to be a woman. When I came to faith in Christ Jesus, I did not cease to be Jewish. Although I'm not a strong, I grew up in a secular Jewish home, not in a religious Jewish home, but nevertheless, I am still Jewish, even as a believer. And so Paul is recognizing the Jewish-Gentile distinction in this passage. And he's done that before. If we go to Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Galatians 2, 7 and 8. He makes that distinction. He says, but on the contrary, seeing that I have been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, meaning the Gentiles, just as Peter has been to the circumcised, meaning the Jews, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. So Paul makes a distinction. Just like we make distinctions, male and female, Jew and Gentile. And so the Israel of God is the remnant of believers from the nation of Israel. And then he says, mercy, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So Paul's proclaiming peace and mercy to all Gentile believers who are living their lives as new creations in Christ Jesus. And he is proclaiming peace and mercy to all Jewish believers who are living their lives as new creations in Christ Jesus. And so let's conclude here with verses 17 and 18. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. When we lived in Saskatchewan over 10 years ago, our family took part in a branding party. That's quite an experience. Here's a city slicker uh, taking part in a branding party. Well, I was more of a part, I was more of a spectator than a participant. But anyway, a wrangler would lasso a calf and hold it down and do a few things to it. I'm not going to go into detail. And finally, brand a symbol on its flesh with a hot iron rod. And the branded symbol identified the cow as property of the owner. While circumcision was a mark that the Jewish people belonged to Moses, and Paul's scars that he's referring to was a mark that he belonged to to the Messiah. And for those who belong to Christ Jesus, grace is how we live our Christian life from start to finish. Our worst days are never so bad that we are beyond the reach of God's grace. And our best days are never so good that we are beyond the need for God's grace. And so as we finish here, Galatians begins with grace. And the book of Galatians ends with grace. And in the same way, our Christian life from start to finish, from beginning to end, our Christian life is lived by grace. And so as we live by grace, let us boast in the cross. Why don't we pray together? Lord, we thank you so much for this incredible, incredible life you've given to us, the incredible resource you have made available to us, the resource of grace so that we can live this life that you called us to live for the glory of your most holy name. There is no way, Lord, that we can live this life, this Christian life that you've called us to, apart from your grace at work in us. Lord, I pray that we would be the type of people who glory in the cross because of what you accomplished on the cross.
And we would be the type of people who live by grace because your grace is sufficient for us, for your power is made perfect in our weakness. And so, Lord, as we go our separate ways this week and as we, and whatever it is that we do, Lord, may you demonstrate your grace to us in powerful ways and may you use us, Lord, in powerful ways. May we be living by the rule that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.